Hello and welcome everybody. Welcome again to, to this awesome time we're going to be having today. God is so good and God is so faithful. Let's just start with a word of prayer as we'll just turn over this next two hours to the most high God, the creator of heaven and earth. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you because you're already here. We thank you because you came here before us. We thank you for your great and awesome plan for us this evening. We thank you for what the blood of Jesus has already paid for. We thank you tonight, our eyes are on you. We thank you for everybody that's on right now or is still coming on. Thank you because our lives will not remain the same. We thank you for the help of your Holy Spirit that is gonna help all the testifiers tonight in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. We give you thanks in advance of an awesome session in Jesus' mighty name, amen, amen, hallelujah. It's good to see every one of you. If any one of your friends are not yet here, please just ping them quickly, tell them we have started and it's going to be an awesome, awesome day today. Hallelujah, thank you for, for letting us come into your homes, into your houses, at this point into your, into your lives this evening is such an awesome privilege. Thank you. My name is Fumi QJ. If, you, if this is your first time of logging on to our sessions, you are so welcome. It's going to be an extraordinary evening. You know, February is a love, um, is a love month for, for, the, for, for, for the world. The world celebrates Valentine in February. But I believe that it's, it's an awesome time for, for, the, for Jesus Christ himself. He is love. And he needs to be celebrated. And as we celebrate the couples that are coming to testify this evening, it's going to be a point of contact for our testimonies as well in Jesus' mighty name. Praise God. A few, if this is your first time of logging in, like I said, this is single but not satisfied. I count it as a privilege to serve God in this capacity. And also God in his awesomeness has surrounded this vision with some awesome ministers that God is using mightily amongst us. Dupsy is on most of you know Dupsy. Dupsy is, is, is a qualified engineer, but she, she has a testimony of marriage as well. She's married to Jolomi. They live in Switzerland. They're both logging in from Switzerland at this point in time. Jolomi is my, is my brother from another mother. And Pastor Disu is also online. Most of you know him. He's the anchor of um, becoming a better man. And he is actually the pastor that, 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 that wedded my husband and myself a strong mentor. God bless you, sir. On all of you that have joined before and are coming in again, thank, thanking you that we can contribute in your journey to be married. We have every a program every month this month, this year 2021, so you don't want to miss any program. Next month is our flagship meeting, which is single but not satisfied, which is our online conference. You don't want to miss it. If you've ever been on one before, you don't need me to tell you to invite you again. It's going to be super awesome. We have prayed. So we know God is going to do awesome things amongst us. If you're, if you're, if you're bold enough, I want you to turn your cameras on tonight so that we can see you, see what your See, see how beautiful and how pretty you look. Thank God for the men that have the that are joining at this point in time. We love you and we really, really celebrate you. Hallelujah. Praise God. Without taking too much time, we're going to go into our first session this evening. I've got two couples that are going to be testifying to the faithfulness and to the goodness of God. Hallelujah. Praise God. The first couple coming on tonight, I've known them for a while. I've known them, I've known them, Josh and Glenda for a while. Josh and Glenda, um, are you there? Can they be spotlighted, please? If they're on there at this point in time, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise God. Josh, Josh and Glenda, thank you for coming on tonight. Um, Hello. Hello. I'm just. Hi. Um, Hi. Hello. Hello. Glenn and Joshua <laughs> are, are just an awesome couple that I've known for about a decade now. Glenn is one of 14 siblings. She's a visionary mother. She's a wife. She's a mother of four, stepmother of two, and a grandmother of two handsome little boys. Oh, my goodness. Glenn, you don't look a day old over 35. <laughs> she's a songwriter. She's a worship leader, a teacher of the word. And I have to call this house. You are a strong intercessor. I, um, 
um, Glenn and I, we, we serve on the intercessory intercessory team in my um, in my church, and she's a strong prophetic leader. She's also a qualified nursery manager, and she's an author. She's written three she's, she's written three books, and you've um, contributed to five. She has her own business. She and what's the name of your cooking business again? I know you have a business where you cook. Big up, cook up. Right. So please share your share your um, 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 your, your 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 profile and let people know what you do. Josh is uh, her husband. He's a father of three. He's a stepfather to three and a grandfather. Josh is a very intelligent man. I've known Josh for a while now. He he's, he runs a library. He loves to read. He has authored nineteen books which includes JJ Granny, which is a series I've seen myself and Jesus and Me series. And one of your books I understand is probably going on TV as a script very soon. I know you are, an, isn't that so? You're an inventor, you're an innovator. I know you make hair and beauty products as well. You do copywriting. You, you and you, you said you also like to eat your mother's food, <laughs> your, your wife's food, I hope you do. <laughs> if not, you'll be, you be out there. Thank you, thank you for agreeing to come on tonight. It's such a privilege to have you on. Josh, do you want do you, Josh and Glenda? Do you want to do you want to just start? Let's let's start with you tonight. Just tell us a little bit about yourself and your journey to be married and what you have for the mature singles that have logged on tonight. Okay, well, um, first we want to thank all of you for for letting us speak with you. Um, we really hope that what we share tonight is going to prove uh, not only inspiring, but uh, we'll try and put some practicals in there as well. We don't know whether we're going to have a chance to share everything. So, so Fumi, please give us a, a 10 minute warning. Uh, so okay. if we need to compact things. Um, yeah. Also, if you can get a pencil and paper, uh, please write down any questions you have, because we, we may get a chance to answer some of them later. Uh, depending Just on how the Holy feel Spirit free to ping your questions into onto the chat and Dupsy will compile them and we can just go through them afterwards. Just feel free to put your questions as you have questions into the chat room, please. Thank you. Go on, Josh. Um, go can on, we then. also suggest that if you have children in the room, um, if you have younger children in the room, maybe put some headphones on them or uh, encourage them to go and watch Netflix in the other room because we're all adults here yeah. and uh, some of the things we may cover you know, it's adult stuff. It's not fairy tale. These are things that that we did, things that we got wrong, things that we struggled with. Um, and, you know, ultimately there was a victory yes. for us. But, you know, let, let's be real. If you're of a certain age, then you've had relationships before um, and you understand what it means to have a relationship and to miss a relationship as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you would... Lovely, lovely. All right, hi, my name is Glenda. Um, how we became single. Um, a little bit about our background and how we became single. Well, I got married when I was 18. I'm just gonna jump right in there because there's so much to tell and we really wanna give you as much as we can. Um, I got oh, married man. when I was 18. Um, I always had a desire for the type of husband I liked and wanted to marry when I grew up. Um, but in my life, as a, as a young teenager, um, you know, our parents, they always kind of think they know what's best for us. Bless their hearts, you know. Lots of times they get it right and sometimes they don't. And for me, that was one of my, um, brought me on this journey um, because my mom had pointed out a particular young man that she thought, you know, I could have made life with, although that was not my desire. I didn't seek God on it. I was a young Christian. I trusted my mom and I went against my heart's desire and I married him. 10 to 15 years down the line, it was a big um, failure. Um, so I'll drop that in there now. So I know some of you can relate to this and we're gonna be as honest with you as possible. Okay, um, Joshua. I, I was 21 when I got married and uh, nobody advised me of anything <laughs> and nobody told me that probably I was too young and possibly too immature uh, to be married. Um, the, the culture I grew up in, people didn't get in your business, so I had almost completely the opposite. Um, my ex-wife and I uh, had two children and 10 years later, 
we were divorced and we really didn't like each other very much either. And that began a time of, of sort of incredible personal pain for me because I'd actually, we'd actually become Christians together, my ex-wife and I, and to actually have a marriage fail anyway and as a Christian was was doubly painful. Yeah. Okay, so me and my ex-husband began that journey. And by the time I was in my 30s, he left the marriage, left me, left the children. That was it for me. I felt my, my life was over. That's the end of it for me because I came up in a program, Holy Mass Church, in the Wesleyan, some of you might know of the Wesleyan Church, and they did not believe in divorce. So as far as I was concerned, that was the end of me. And that was devastated for me. It was really, really bad. I didn't want to go outside. I didn't want to see anyone. I couldn't understand why God would allow this to happen for me, to me. Why me? You know, that was my question. Why me? Why did God allow this? I, I've given God my youth. I become a Christian when I was 17, you know, and I served God. Most of coming up, I grew up in the church to begin with. And I couldn't understand why God had let this happen to me. Me and my three children, a single parent in a country where there's no, you know, social support um, in terms of finances from the government like we have in this country, social security and all of that, nothing. Um, so I, my journey began there in, in, in finding myself in God. Um, and I think it's the same for Joshua or similar. Yeah, I mean... I, I took it very badly. Uh, I took it very badly, firstly, because of, you know, divorce is no joke. Any of you have been through it, or even a long-term relationship, um, when it splits up, the, the, the emotional element, the sexual element, you, you're bonded. The Bible says that you're bonded when you, you do certain things. And um, for me, it was like a rending of my soul, and I took it so badly. Um, one was that at the time, as a Christian, I, I'd come up with a lot of traditional teachings about divorce. Now, my wife, ex-wife, left me. But as I understood it at the time, I couldn't remarry. And the, 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 the pain was so great that at some, one point, I, I went to the edge of madness. I, I took myself off to Wales. I bought all this climbing equipment. I climbed to the top of a mountain and I stood there wondering whether I was going to throw myself off. Um, you know, let's not let's not fool ourselves here. The ending of a relationship can be absolutely devastating, but I'm, I'm happy to say the wind came up and I discovered that, see, I'd like to say I was brave. Jesus all the way. No, I was just a coward. <laughs> so I thought, okay, I'm a coward. I can't kill myself. I'm going to go back and make something of my life with the Lord. For me, I spent time in God's presence. I started to read the book of Job and I would encourage those of you who've had coming from a broken marriage or even a broken long-term relationship. My answer was in the book of Job. I read the story of Job um, and that really gave me strength and I started to regain myself. I spent time in God's presence at night when others were asleep. I'm in the church, I lay on the altar. I'm telling you guys, I lay myself on the altar and I wept before God on the altar asking God to do something for me, bring my husband back, you know? You can do this, Lord. You said that you don't want this divorce. You don't want us to be divorced or to be separated, but he is gone and he's not coming back. Um, I took my children with me and we, were, we would be in the church. I, I remember I wrote God letters about how I felt, you know, I poured everything out before God. And then at some point, even while studying the book of Job, when I got to the final ch chapter of Job, I found um, I heard the spirit of God said to me, just let him go. And that's when the healing began for me. I'd love to say I was as righteous as her, but I did entirely the wrong thing. Um, a week after I got divorced, a sister who had been interested in me asked me out on a date. I didn't realize how interested in me she was, but until we went, got to Jamie Oliver's restaurant, she spent a fortune on, on food, bought me presents and gifts. And of course, because I wasn't on the rebound, I mean, whoever is, it's only for other people, right? I fell for her. Um, yes, thank you. I'm very glad I didn't jump off the mountain too. Uh, it was a pure dating relationship. You know, there was no, no kissing, physical contact or whatever. But 
um, she broke my heart all over again. So I had to, <laughs> I had to recover from that too. But eventually, when I started to get my sanity back, I threw myself into serving the Lord. And I have to say, if you're going through pain, honestly, one of the best things you can do is force yourself to spend more time with the Lord. And from someone who's done it, it's worth doing. It's rewarding, yeah. For me, I started praying and fasting. And this time, I started to ask God, because now I heard clearly from God to let my ex-husband go. I said, God, if you're going to take this husband from me, I know that you've got something better for me. Obviously, I've seen in the scripture with Job and Job's wife, you know the story. God gave him a brand new wife. He gave him, you know, double, double for his trouble. And that was me. I was believing for the double Lord. And I said, God, you, if you're going to give me a husband this time, I'm going to ask you my desire. Because even if I don't tell you those desires, you still know them. And this time I'm not going to get this wrong. I'm going to pray only for your will and your will only. And if my desire is not your desire, then you give me your best desire. However, I started out with that mindset that God's going to give me the desire of my heart. And I started to pray and fast for a husband, a godly man. I described my husband from head to toe, <laughs> you know, it, and when I came even to the UK, it became even clearer, you know, and I really, even to the color of his eyes, my husband's going to tell you a bit more about the change of his eyes, but um, even to the color of his eyes, I couldn't decide what color his eyes should be, whether green or blue. <laughs> and um, sometimes, you know, they change color, but he will tell you a bit more about that. But again, I want to encourage you, those of you who have got your list, it's all good to have a list. Remember, God has the final say. But those desires that we have, God give us desires. And he said that if we delight ourselves in him, he will give us the desires of our heart. So people might think you're fanatic and they might think you're too much or you're over the top. But if you've got a desire, maybe God has given you that desire. And if God hasn't given you that desire, then he has got something better for you. But start from where you're at. Be open to him to make the final decision. I mean, I, I want to second that in terms of being honest with yourself. Um, when I was growing up, the area that I lived in, there were various sort of cultural and racial groups, but um, interracial dating, if I may use that as a term, it just didn't happen. I mean, I remember I was about 11. The first time, this was sort of early 80s, the first time I ever saw like, like a black man and a white woman who were obviously together, I, I hid behind a car over the other side of the road and just watched with my eyes wide because I'd just never seen it. Um, but I remember when I was heading to school about 14, I, I saw some of the some of the African girls who went to our school. And just for a moment, my heart went, whoa. And then it just cut off because it wouldn't have been possible knowing how to sort of breach that cultural barrier that existed at the time. It just It just wasn't possible. So it was only after I was divorced, I was married to um, a white lady, uh, that God resurfaced that in my heart. And, mm. I, and I said, that's actually what I, what I want to do. I want to, I want to date, date some black women and, and see where that goes. Another thing, what I noticed as well, just before I met Joshua, his name used to be Douglas. And just before I met him, watch out for the counterfeit because a counterfeit did come. There was this guy whose name was Douglas, Obviously, I was still, you know, still a bit broken and, you know, still want that desire to be fulfilled. I'm a young, you know, at that time, not as young as I am now, but, you know, middle-aged <laughs> woman whose husband has decided to leave. And um, those desires and everything was there, for, you know, for companionship, for love, to fill that void. And this guy's name was Douglas and he came along, you know, beautiful eyes as well, funny enough. Um, and he's a Guyanese. And um, soon enough, I discovered that he wasn't the one because he hadn't had a relationship with God. He made mockery of Christians. Sometimes when we talk, he would say some things and there were warning signs. And as soon as, not long after I, I opened that door, I had to shut that door and I had to end it because he wasn't the one God had for me. And I can hear the spirit of God saying to me, he's not the one. So I had to let him go. So again, look out for those things because while you're waiting on God, 
The devil knows your desire because he can hear what you're praying. He doesn't know what's in your mind until you speak it. So be careful what you say. But even when you say, he tries to bring a counterfeit. So again, you need to test the spirit. I'm not saying shut things down just like that, but test the spirit. One of the things that can be really difficult for us when we're alone is exactly that. It's the lack of uh, company of the opposite sex. I mean, we're going to have to jump ahead a little bit for yeah, time, yeah. but um, the church that I went to before uh, Destiny Christian Center, which is where we've been for about what, 10 years, yeah, 12 years? Over, yeah, as long as it's... Um, the church I went to, I'm not going to mention where it was because there is some control. there was some controversy associated with it, but one of the things they did right was they taught about what we would call friendship dates. And what it was, the, the, the brothers were expected to take all of the sisters out, um, you know, obviously one at a time, <laughs> <laughs> um, on a friendship basis. And this, as I came to understand it, was uh, for companionship. It was for, and it also, it, it helped you develop uh, getting to know the opposite sex because some of us are shyer than others um, I, I certainly wasn't you know ex exceptionally bold and I I went on friendship dates with sisters from all kinds of different places and uh, ranging in age from 18 to sort of late 50s um, and if if your church doesn't do this I think it's wise to approach the pastor because something I've discovered a lot of brothers have what I call a nightclub mentality they think if they approach a sister in church and ask her to hang out, it's either going to be just because he likes her or he's afraid that she's going to do a, you know, a, a nightclub rejection <laughs> and it's going to embarrass him. I, I could be wrong, but this is my impression from speaking to people. So don't be afraid to approach another brother or sister and just say, you want to hang out? Yeah. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit on dating and on joining the dating site. Um, I did join a dating site um, and there's some lovely people on there. Um, Joshua as well joined the dating site. And, you know, there's lovely people, but there's also people who, who are a bit fast and a bit um, creepy. creepy. <laughs> <laughs> but um, we met lovely people there as well. And um, you wanted to say a bit on that. Yeah. Um Again, I'll, I'll have to be brief, but um, sisters, I know some of you, maybe a lot of you, certainly the ones that have spoken to me have had bad experiences on dating sites, but you know, one bad egg doesn't make the whole box rotten. The good thing about dating sites is that you control the speed of the interaction. And all I'll say is if a man, a brother you meet on a dating site respects the speed at which you wish to make contact, i.e. messaging first, phone second, and if you're not comfortable to meet up, he'll keep messaging you or, or, or phoning. To me, that's a good sign. It shows respect. If he can respect, respect your boundaries at a distance, then he is more likely to respect your boundaries when you meet him. Yeah. Okay. Even though I did meet some crazy people on there too. <laughs> <laughs> For me, um, part of my testimony is, is that um, I needed, my husband needed to be, um, a man that had the same experience with me. So even though he's a man, but we must have shared the same experience. These were my signs to know when it's him. Um, I said he must have children, a boy and a girl, because I had children and I would want him to be a father figure to my children as well and to love my children because they've went through a lot, you know, from a broken home and all of that. Um, so that was part of my testimony. And, you know, God, uh, the spirit of God had asked me to go over to another congregation to support. Um, I didn't understand why there weren't lots of men there. So I wasn't going for a husband but I felt the call of God to go and to support this congregation. And that's what I did just before the Lord sent my husband. Again, just for time, it's okay to visit other congregations. It doesn't make you a church hopper. I, I visited other congregations because I wanted to meet with other Christians. I feel that Christianity is too fragmented, 23,000 different church denominations. It's ridiculous. We need to look for what we have in common and you can find someone who's right for you as long as you share the same core beliefs. We don't agree. There are definitely scriptural things to this day, 15 years later, that we don't agree on. 
but they're not salvation issues. Um, and for time, I was invited to her church. I walked in. The pastor said, would anybody like to give a testimony about what God has done for them? Now, I would just reached the other side of all that pain I told you about. And the Holy Spirit said, go up. She was in front of me with her bad attitude about having been moved. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's the other thing as well, because the strokes, when I was sitting, the strokes, I was sitting in a specific seat and the strokes came over to me and said, you can't sit there. And um, in my head, I didn't argue with her. I moved, <laughs> but in my head, I was like, I don't understand why I can't sit there because it's an empty seat. There's nobody here. We sit on these chairs every week and nobody comes to sit on this side. I don't understand why I can't sit here in my head. Anyway, I obeyed. So my body was saying one thing and my spirit was saying something else, but I followed. And she put me to sit right in front where my husband was sitting. He was just seated just behind me. Bearing in mind, um, he was, um, after I prayed for him for like three and a half years, fasting and praying, I started to get dreams with him. So I started to see him in my dream, what he would look like and so on. So. And even at that point, I didn't recognize him because obviously I didn't want to move to sit there. <laughs> yeah. But once I started giving my testimony, she did recognize me. And again, we're having to sort of accelerate, but she couldn't eat for a week and she didn't speak to me that day. She got my number from the sister who, who invited me. But she started calling me, you know, we built a friendship and it was, it was a pure friendship. I was starting to get interested in someone else so I genuinely didn't think that she was interested in me yes men are stupid <laughs> and sometimes you need to be more direct but eventually she did tell me in fact you want to tell them briefly what you told yeah, me yes so eventually what happened is that we started to talk um, because his testimony was exactly the opposite and God said to me this is my husband it made sense and um, the sister who invited him to church she passed his number on to me. So I texted him and said, can we have a chat? Can we have a conversation? We share the same testimony. I would like to hear, you know, some of what you did to overcome and I can share some of what I did to overcome. And he was happy as a brother in Christ. I remember him signing your brother in Christ. I was like, yes, my brother in Christ. <laughs> and um, we started to talk on the phone every evening. I remember the first conversation we had, I was laughing, he was laughing over things that we went through from our um, exes. And um, that was hope for me. Anyway, we continued to talk for a while. And this other person that he was seeing, um, they were meeting on, on the site isn't it through the site and um he was having they were having issues of not being able to meet up and um so he would share that with me and so on and then eventually she decided that she's going to meet up and obviously our friendship was becoming more solid still friendship pure friendship god revealed to me he's my husband but he didn't know god hadn't told him yet and i hadn't told him and um, so eventually when he said he's going to meet her up and he would like me to give him some tips. <laughs> he want me to give him some tips so he can go and, you know, talk with her because she was from Barbados. I'm from Guyana. It's very close. Those of you who know South America and um, I might be able to help him. So anyway, um, I decided, Lord, I can't do this. So I spoke with a very good friend. And again, you need to have good friends, good sisters in your life that you can talk, real talk with. I spoke to one of my sisters and I said, well, you know, this is the situation. This is my God. Show me this is my husband. I've been dreaming, dreaming him for years. Now he has come. God has sent me to a congregation, send him in the congregation. He shared his testimony, the two testimonies match. We are now friends and now he's meeting up with someone and he wants my counsel. She gave me two pieces of advice. She said, you're going to have to tell him. And I'm like, ah, no, tell him what? Anyway, um, she said to me two pieces of advice. She said, if you tell him, what have you got to lose? If you don't tell him, what have you got to lose? So I went back to God in prayer and I decided, okay, I'm just going to have to just gently walk this path and I'm just going to text him and just ask him if he thinks that I'm the one God has sent or if God should say to you, I am actually the one that he has sent. 
how would you react? Would you be upset? Would you be, you know, and all these emotions I put in there for him to respond. This, to this day, is still one of the boldest things I've ever heard. <laughs> that you text someone you're friends with and just say, <laughs> you know, what would you think if the Lord said that you were my husband? My response was, I think you were a crazy lady. <laughs> I actually dropped the phone, quite literally. I dropped the phone. I was on the phone to someone else, and I was like, you are not going to believe what this crazy woman has said to me. Because we were just friends. I was never brought up to play the field. If you're interested in someone, which wasn't her, in, in that way, then you don't lead people on. You, It's not wrong to go out on dates with multiple people, but to me, the moment you start really liking someone, you, you downplay and cut off those other ones. Anyway, I spoke to a sister and she said, look, go and meet her. You never know what the Lord will do. And maybe some other time we'll get to share. But we met and the first time we met, there's almost no way to describe it. But, you know, the, the hand of God was just heavy upon me. And I just, she was talking and her voice faded away. And I just knew the Lord was telling me that this woman who I'd only ever met once in the flesh, was my wife um and, and we i can tell you more about that later but anyway we started um i said okay fine lord whatever you want because when the lord wants you to do something you can refuse but it's like driving with all the brakes on uh. um i went to see the other lady i did meet her and and the lord was extremely gracious and this goes back to the sort of nightclub thing that the person that you're letting down is a brother or sister in Christ, you can't treat them like they're, they're, they're just some person you met in a nightclub. And the Lord gave me some wisdom to say to this lady that, you know, I, I really like you, but I'm not planning to have more children. Um, and I, I believe that you do want children. Maybe it's better that we, we don't continue from here. Because that was true. I didn't want any more children. Anyway, we just want to briefly say something about our dating relationship for the simple reason that when you've been out of a relationship for a while and suddenly you're in a relationship with someone you're attracted to spiritually and physically, your body starts to wake up. Real talk. Yes. Real talk. Yeah. Um, and, and you have to know how to deal with that. And you have to know how to deal with if you go wrong. Yeah. We did go a bit wrong. Um, we didn't end up sleeping together, but, you know, hands went somewhere they shouldn't have gone. Real talk here. Um, so Glenda's going to say a little bit about what we set in place at the start, if, if that's okay, Fumi, if we can still do that. Literally got five minutes gone. <laughs> wow, okay. Thank you. Okay, good. Um, so basically what we did, we set up accountability partners. So Joshua spoke with someone from that he really, really trusts in the kingdom. And I did the same with someone I really, really trust in the kingdom. And I said to her, look, I need you to check on me every week and ask me how things are going between us in terms of, you know, kissing, touching and all of that, because I really want to give God glory in this and we can't mess this up. And so we have to take those drastic steps just to make sure that we stay pure. I mean, when we went, had our first counseling session after 18 months, um, we did not kiss. No, and when we had our first counseling session, the minister, the pastor that was counseling us, um, when we said to him that we've never kissed, he pitched up out of his chair. Um, and we're not saying this to don't play anyone. And, no. you know, if you've kissed, you know, we're not judging you. No. But the point is we're saying we really wanted to keep things pure between us because we recognize that God had done this for us and we really wanted to give him glory in our relationship. And he got up and he asked us about three times before he sat down back, are you saying to me that you've never kissed before? And we said, no, we've never kissed. And he had to ask the question three times before he actually settled back down to carry on with the counseling session. Yeah. So for 18 months, we did not kiss. And one of the other things I want to drop in quickly, because I'm, I'm, I realize we haven't got much time. After two months, we got engaged. There was no time to waste. There was no time to wait. Not that, not that we were rushing, but I knew that God had sent him. He knew that he was my husband. There was no need for us to be fuffing around. 
We were big people. We were already married before. We know what marriage entails. We come from a family background. You know, we were way in our thirties, um, you know, big people. And we decided, my husband decided, well, why are we gonna wait? God told me it's you, you know it's me. Um, why don't we just, you know, get married? So then he asked me to marry him two months in our relationship. So again, you know, time doesn't really matter if you know you have met the right person. Yeah, and the last thing I want to say, because obviously we can't share much more than this for now. Um, after 18 months, we were supposed to get married, but there were rules in the UK at that time about citizens not being able to marry people whose status wasn't entirely settled. So we planned the wedding and everything. We'd applied for a, a government license to marry. Yes, even in this country, for at that, that time. at that time, we needed a license, uh, a special license, and they denied it. And after that, we did we, we, we did we did struggle. We did kiss, um, and as I say, we you know we didn't sleep together. But once we kissed, we'd awoken love before oh. its time, and we had to set more things in place. So we went to the accountability partners. Um, so if if you have uh, struggled, if you have fallen, you know that Christ will forgive you. We're not trying to make anyone feel guilty no. because we know that it was incredibly difficult for us. But having seen it through, and, and again, that's why there's not supposed to be any children in the room, after 13 years of marriage, <laughs> I can say that, 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 that not having done that yeah. before marriage is a gift to... that kept, keeps on giving. And yeah. Uh, yeah, I think at that point, I'm going to hand back over to Vimy. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so, so very much. Thank you, Glenda. Thank you, Josh. You guys are just excellent and brilliant people and I appreciate you. Please feel free to type your questions. And while we're compiling that question and getting ready to bring up um, the next couple, the next couple are just people that God supernaturally connected me to as well. So Dupti, do you want us to share one or two flags before I bring up Pastor and Pastor Mrs, please? Thank you. Thank you, Josh. Really, really appreciate you. Thank you for me. Um, I'm just going to um, use a segment. My name is Deepay, I'm Deepsy, like everybody calls me. And uh, in this segment is just an icebreaker. And um, these are scenarios. These are real scenarios that I'm just going to share and give you the opportunity for a few seconds to decide if the situation is, um, a temporary obstacle between the couples or if it's actually a red flag and they need to end the relationship. So I'm gonna start with the first one. He was married multiple times and now he finds himself divorced yet again. Through reflections and searching for answers, he found Christ and then he met a lady. He dated briefly and then, he, and then they got married. Two years later, he found out she was cheating on him and he walked away from the marriage and found himself divorced, single again. He has now met a new lady and the relationship is flourishing, but he's uncertain because of his history. Sorry, she is uncertain because of his history. Is there an opportunity for improvement in this relationship? Is this a temporary obstacle? Or is this a red flag because he's had a history of multiple marriages? Please um, either give me a thumbs up or put something in the chat to see what you think. Red flag, I see someone say red flag. Anybody else? Red flag, temporary obstacle? Red flag, okay, I see someone say it's temporary. Okay, more red flags red flags okay so um i would say this is a red flag unless you know just like the couple just shared that the lord has told you and you need to be really um careful about that um you do have to understand that um a situation like this where someone's had several relationships and they are the common denominator there must be a problem so we consider this a red flag and i'll just do another one in this situation, they are Christians and they have been dating for about two years. He's showing interest, but has not spoken seriously about marriage. She has invested so much time and cannot wait any longer because she wants to get pregnant. 
She even starts to sleep with him, hoping that a pregnancy would trigger a proposal. It's been more than six months now and there's neither a proposal nor a pregnancy. And then they had a big argument where she threatened to leave him and he finally proposes and the wedding is in three months. Is this, I can see people talking already. Is this okay? Lots of red flags, red flags. Okay, alarm, okay. I see all your comments, thanks very much. This is definitely a red flag because um, a marriage is a relationship between two people, it's free will, and you should not, neither the male or the female, um, force a proposal. It will definitely not turn out well. Thanks very much. Oh, for that. You. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. My next guest coming up is lovely people. The first time I saw Pastor Bolanle preach, I actually call her Pastor B because I have to adopt her as my big sister. She doesn't know yet. The first time I had her preach, somebody had sent me a video of what she had preached in the Sarah conference and said for me, you would like this lady. Her, her testimony is similar to yours. So today I'm bringing Pastor Bolanle Oje and her husband up, Pastor, Pastor David and Pastor Bolanle. Pastor Bolanle is a pastor of MK Tabernacle which is everybody knows Jesus House in London. So Jesus House is a parish of Jesus House based out here in Milton Kings. She has over 20 years experience in the ministry. She served as an ordained minister of God under the umbrella of the redeemed Christian Church of God. She's a committed teacher of the word. She's been, she's, she was married as a mature single. So she knows what it is like to wait for a spouse. She's gonna share her testimony with you today to encourage, encourage us. And she has a, 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 unique, um, a unique program on Instagram, which is um, uh, um, 40 single and sane. I've only had the privilege of joining once in flesh, but I've had the video sent to me and it was such an awesome program last Tuesday, Pastor. You know, she's also the, um, and she's an entrepreneur. She owns Bees Grilled Chicken, which is an outfit that supplies food and lunch packs to people out here at Milton Kings. She's married to Pastor David OJ, who's an executive pastor at MK Tabernacle as well. He's an entrepreneur, a consultant, and owns the Lon London Laundry Club. They both have four lovely grown-up children and four grandchildren. Wow, Pastor B, I'm, I need to look at you so I can spotlight you. Hallelujah, what a privilege to have you on here ministering to us today. Hello, Sarah, hello, ma'am. Thank good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you so much. And please, over to you. Okay. Um, thank you, first of all, for having us. Uh, it's really an honor to be here tonight. Um, it's, um, it's a joy to be able to share a story that we've had, uh, well, our testimony um, from 2008. 2008. Hey, <laughs> this is how it happened. Anyhow, um, I'll I'll start off and then he'll come in when you know. It's actually her story, so I'll just I'll help. I'll help. <laughs> um, Both your well, story, Pastor. Both your. <laughs> I I turned I turned I turned forty. Uh, when I was thirty nine, when I was thirty, I'm just jumping in at the middle somewhere because I know for lack of time. But when I was 39, I, I switched from the ever so depressed, ever so, um, you know, everything was about, I have to have a husband. I can't do anything without a husband. I have to, I'm gonna stay in this flat until I have a husband. I'm gonna, I can't travel to see places and enjoy myself without a husband. All of that happened. And then when I turned 39, sorry, after I turned 39, I decided, when, I, when I'm going to turn 40, then I'll start living. They say life begins at 40. Without a husband, I might as well get it going or else, you know, time was flying by. And I had wasted my 30s doing everything about, everything I, about me was about a man. And then anyhow, I had um, a 40th birthday party and it was, it was awesome. Now, bearing in mind that um, I had a very short, I wouldn't call it a, a very short. It was like a seven-month relationship. 
and I got dumped. I got dumped at 38, okay? I got dumped at 38. The dumper came to my 39th birthday party. It was a very small thing in the house and all that. And I was thinking, you know, where, where's all, what's going on? I was confused, I was upset, I was depressed. Long story short, 40 came along and I decided, listen, you know what? Man or no man, it's time to enjoy my life. So that was when I now started. I now I traveled and did all I wanted to do, even though I still insisted that I was going to stay in this flat that I, I, I was renting at the time. And I insisted I was going to stay in this flat until a man showed up. Um, fast forward, I had to pray myself out of this flat because I said to the Lord, I said, Lord, you are not a man that you should lie you know, but I am man, I can lie. And therefore, even though I insisted that I was not gonna go to a man's, I was not gonna leave this flat until there was a man in my life. I now changed that, Lord, I repent, please take me out of this house. And he moved me, praise God, into a beautiful flat somewhere outside London. And then um, I was 44 at the time. I'm, I'm really cutting the story very short. I now turned 44. And I was enjoying this new flat I had just got. It was a two bedroom flat. I was enjoying, you know, decorating it, having it all set up. And I was enjoying my relationship with the Lord because all this time when I had determined everything was no longer about me, it's about enjoying my life and enjoying this God that I serve. So the focus shifted from me and my selfish desires, if I can put it that way, and it shifted to me having a guy in my life, sorry, it shifted to me having a good relationship with God. So I was enjoying all of that. And then there was one particular morning, um, I was, you know, still in the process of decorating the house, you know, I didn't have that much money, so I couldn't decorate all at once. So I decorated um, as the money came. And I was, I was putting flowers in this corner, putting pillowcases on the pillows on that side of the, uh, on cushions and stuff. And I was now like, oh God, I'm really enjoying this flat. And knowing you, knowing you, Papa, the kind of Papa that you are, you're now going to make some guy come along and sweep me out of this beautiful flat. And that's where it all started. We had this, um, this gentleman, okay, I think you should tell tell us what happened. Okay. Okay. Tell tell us You're right. the 2007, uh, 2006. Okay. okay. I, I have been married before actually, so with, with children. So my name is David. And um, my uh, my wife and I, we my late wife, we were married for 21 years. You know, and then she she yeah. passed on at uh, in 2007, January 2007. And um, and we had we had four children then, you know, four teenage children. Yeah, they were four teenage children. And then um, he, and I was actually, you know, so because I've known this young lady, you know, <laughs> way back as you know since 1995 because we went to the same church, you know. So, um, but in the process of my wife passing away, we had moved to another church. Well, we we went to another church Irish. plant, another parish in Oxbridge. And that's where she, you know, she got ill and took us five years, went through about five years of uh, treatment. Eventually she, she, she passed on in 2007. So I went back to Jesus' house in 2007. Just, you know, thought, let me just, you know, go back, sit down, look after the children because we have three boys and a girl. And it wasn't easy then, you know, having to look after boys in, in London. So it was quite a challenge. Well, you know, we, 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 so I concentrated on the, on the guys and then we, and also we had a business run. I had a business run as well. So it was quite a very busy time for me. But with the, the help of church members and, and families, so I, I was really able to cope. But what I now find out is that, listen, I have never lived alone. I have never in my life. I got married at 30 and I, I lived at home before I got married, you know. So I lived, you know, uh, in London, you know, at home with my, you know, sibling and, you know, so I did not, I had never lived alone in my life. And there was, uh, you know, 2007 with four, you know, four kids. And I said, no, I, this is not going to happen. God, God has sought me out here. And at the same time, you really want somebody who is, you know, a godly woman who will, I mean, who you can build a kingdom together with. So we, so I stayed in church and, um, 
sorry, I'm going to jump in here. I'm going to jump in here. He so because she died in she died in January of twenty sorry of two thousand and seven, and he moved back to Jesus House around October November of two thousand and seven. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. He moved back to Jesus House 2000. So all that time you kind of had, you needed to go through your healing yes, process. Absolutely. And uh, okay. And then he came into Jesus House, back to Jesus House, where I was um, an assistant pastor at the time. And he came into Jesus House. And around uh, the end of November, one of our senior pastors was drafting a list of new um, members to different work departments in church. We have different departments in the church and I was in charge of the teaching department. And the next thing I saw was a list was uh, sent out and they said, this gentleman was going to be in my department. And I thought to myself, oh no, I don't want, you know, it's always, it's very wrong to have preconceived ideas of what people are like. So even though I knew him back in the nineties, I, we, we were not, yeah. we were not really, we, we were not, I wouldn't call us even family friends or anything, you know, but I was closer to his late wife because of the business in church that put us together as workers, but I didn't really know him. In fact, I can't, I don't have any recollection of any of his activities back then. But when he was sent to my department in December of 2007, I was like, no, I don't want this man in my department. I don't want this guy. He's going to start talking and wanting to take over everything. I didn't know him. I didn't know all, I didn't know anything about that part of him, but I just decided I don't want this. And I told my, I said, we're supposed to be called pastors over the members of our department. So I said, how do you expect me to pastor this old pastor? You know, and I was complaining and saying this to our um, senior pastor at the time. And he said, don't worry, God will give you the knowledge and understanding to do the right thing. You know, <sighs> anyhow, we left it at that. And then he joined the department. He, he hardly said anything. Did I even tell you, you know, don't talk? He doesn't, he doesn't talk much, by the way. So he came, he joined the department. He wouldn't say anything. And we would have, actually, I would have to try and kind of ginger him to say things, you know, Pastor David, what do you think about this? When we're talking about doctrine or here and there, and he wouldn't, he wouldn't say much, but anything he contributed was always, mm. and you know, and I'm attracted to, I'm attracted to depth. I'm attracted to people who are profound, you know, I'm attracted to those kind of things. And I am also very attracted to quiet people. So when he was very quiet and all that, I'm thinking things were beginning to tick in my mind, but I, I always chopped them down because I didn't want to, you know, start whipping up any fantasies and all that, if you know where I'm coming from. Long story short, you know, the department went on for, as a very nice uh, place to be. And then we had a conference where we all had to go. Um, we, we, we were both ministers at the time. He was now a minister and we all had to travel for this um, program. And the only way he could get down there was to hitch a ride and he had to hitch a ride from me. So he hitched a ride with me and one other darling sister. And she shares my name, Bolanle. And we, want, we all went together, a threesome. And we traveled to this uh, conference. And everything was ginger and rosy. We talked and talked, and everybody had fun. At the conference, I left my Bible in the car, in the car park. And the car park was quite a distance from where the conference was actually happening. And this is very important that I mention this. So as, as um, he offered, he offered straight away, he said, don't worry, I'll go get your Bible for you. So he went to that car park and everybody had gone into the conference. So I had to wait outside to ensure that he didn't start looking for us because the place was quite packed so that he doesn't quite start looking for us. Now on his way back into the hall, he was walking towards me with my Bible and, and I just, it just, hit me and I thought to myself, my, this guy is such a handsome, good looking. And he was wearing turtleneck. And that's one thing that floors me. Any guy in a turtleneck, ooh, ah, you look good. So he was wearing this dark turtleneck thing. And I thought to myself, this guy looks good. Oh my goodness. And, you know, cut a long story even shorter. Then um, at the conference, we sat together and then different people started texting. Hmm, what's going on? I can see you sitting with that lovely guy. What's going on? Are you guys dating yet? What's going on? 
And of course, my head started to swim, but I was still trying to, you know, put think, push it down under there because I didn't want a situation where it was just something that I was imagining or all that. In his own mind, he had started saying something. He, he, he actually voiced this out to someone at the conference, but she told me later that he had said, oh, he's looking for somebody and he thinks he had found her. And that lady was trying to hint that he has found you. But I, all those things, you know, you don't want to start imagining things. Um, two weeks later, we had to travel to Nigeria. He lost his uncle. I lost my dad. I had lost my dad in January, but the time to bury him was in April. He lost his uncle somewhere beyond, before that, and he had to travel in April. So we traveled together. Sorry, we traveled at the same time on different flights and everything. But we stayed in touch. Oh, hi, and how's everything going? Did you have, how was your flight? Did you land well? And then the next thing I saw, some, you know, sweeter texts started coming through. Hi, my sunshine, how are you doing today? Oh, hello. Oh, um, uh, hi, beautiful. Um, oh, I said, oh, um, in Nigeria, there's something, there's a, there's a plague of mosquitoes. Mosquitoes are always all over the place. And if you don't have proper netting and all that, you know, you could, so I said, oh, I had a few bites of, a few mosquito bites. And he said, oh, I wish I was there to help rob something on it. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness, where's all this coming from? So I sent to him, I wrote a uh, thing to him. I said, listen, I sent a text. We need to chat. We need to have a talk because I don't know where all of this is going or where it's coming from. And then of course, all the sweet nothing still kept coming, you know, like three, four texts a day. And I'm thinking, oh, and then my younger sister, she's late now. She looked at me and she said, sis, there's something happening. I can see it. I can see it in the spirit. There's something happening. There's a sudden glow about you. And I'm thinking, no, glow. I haven't glowed in a long time. <laughs> long story short, we um, went for my dad's funeral. Should I tell the dream about the dream? Of course, from uh, your, your friend. My best friend had a dream. My best friend's husband had a dream like five years before this time and said, that we were at an event. He doesn't know what the event was, but at that event, there was this gentleman in a white in, in, in a white kaftan, and he came for the event, and he's your husband for sure. He said he could see him and everything. This was five, like five years before this. And every time my friend or and I were talking, or every, I'm like, where is this white guy in a white garment? Where is he? Where is he? Why is he taking so long? Anyhow, at this particular event. He came to the service of songs for my dad that we had in the village. And in that um, service of songs, he came in a purple um, kaftan. He came in a purple kaftan. My best friend and her husband were also at the event. And as soon as they saw him, because I had been texting my friend, I said, there's something happening. There's something happening. I don't know. There's a rumbling in the jungle. I'm not sure, you know. So as soon as they, he appeared with his brother, he was wearing a purple kaftan. And my best friend, we were at the event, my best friend texted and said, oh, fine, purple is fine. Purple was dyed from white, purple was dyed with white, with purple dye, it must have been white before. You know, everything were, just went so sweetly. We had the chat where he asked me out and I said, listen, I said, I, the next day, the next day, yeah. I said, I don't do dating. I don't do dating at my age, I'm 45 now. I can't, sorry, I was 44. Yeah, going, my, my birthday is in May. So this was April. I said, I'm 44. I can't do dating. Dating suggests that you want to test drive the car before you pay for it. I said, I'm too old to be test driven. If you want anything specific, say. And then he said, okay, no, he wants a long-term relationship. Da, da, da. Okay, all right. I said, fine, we'll go for it. And the next day, guess what? I had no clue. My friend and um, my friend and her husband and him, they were all in, and his brother, they were in a different hotel in this town that we went to do this, my dad's funeral. And the next thing, my friend sent me a text. He's wearing a white kaftan. He's wearing a white kaftan. So apparently he had several kaftans in his box and he, in his suitcase. So the one he wore for the very event that my, hus my friend's husband had seen, had dreamt of, back then was the white captain and he came in the white captain and that was when he sent it and he saw me he sent a, he cut a long story short that was where we knew for sure that this man had rolled into my life praise god now 
we got back to we got back to civilization, if I can put it that way, and we presented the whole thing to our pastor. The pastor, we have a senior granddad in, in Jesus' house, um, Dr. Onuzo. We took the matter before him because it's always good to have spiritual lead, um, spiritual accountability, as the previous couple said. So we talked about it and the gentleman gave us his blessing. My mom was rejoicing. My siblings were all glad. My dad, don't forget, he had just passed away. It was a sad thing, it was bittersweet for me, you know, but it was all sweet, sweet, sweet. And um, of course, I we didn't, we didn't, um, he proposed in May, cut a long story short. He proposed the next month, uh, it was after my birthday though. He proposed, went down on both knees, <laughs> went down on both knees because he couldn't support himself on one knee. <laughs> went down on both knees and proposed. And it was a delight, it was, you know, I had said to myself many years before, I said, listen, the day somebody proposed to me, proposes to me, I'm sure I'm gonna burst out crying. No, she sure. didn't. I didn't, I was too <laughs> I was like, yeah, you know, it was it was a pleasant thing. Um, and I think one thing that I did that I know that happened was this: my focus changed. My 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 I I I I threw away the garment of despair and the garment of depression and the garment of you know depending on it had to be about a man and all that. And I allowed God to. I allow God to build me back up. Now you share your part from <laughs> from uh, the village. <laughs> from the village. <laughs> from the vi I, How many I, minutes I, do we have left? Sorry. Please keep going. Okay. I, I, I really don't remember much about coming back from the village, but um, at least when we when we got back to London, uh, London, I had to. I mean, of course, we had to go and see the pastor, mm -hmm. and who who you know. I mean, guided us spiritually, if you know what I mean. But at the same time, you know, we, there, there was that with four teenage children. Oh, and sorry, it, sorry, I have know. to take you back. No, we have to go back to the conference. I have to, you have to tell them about the conference where I came to hug you and you thought it was, I thought it was an innocent hug. You had read some meaning to it. You say. You say. <laughs> at the conference, at the conference I mentioned, the final morning when we were having breakfast and we all we were on a queue, I just went, saw him from afar said, ah, and I used to call him Uncle D at the time. So I said, Uncle D, Uncle D, how are you? Uh -uh. We came to this conference together and you just went your separate ways. How are you? And I just gave him a, a very regular, innocent hug. But tick, 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 in his own mind, he thought, yeah, that's my green light to go for it, you know? And that's when the text really got so... <laughs> Oh my goodness! Anyway, go for anyway, it. Anyway, so um, now we have, you know, of course, you know, I got this this uh, four children that you know you had to we had to deal with. It was it was not easy because don't forget their mom just died just just over a year, mm. and there was I you know with somebody else. So it was quite a difficult situation. Well, I mean, we prayed. God helped us through it. You know, I mean, it took it took time. You know, I'm sure Joshua will attest to this. And uh, you know, don't forget. She had never been married. Mm. I have been married for 21 oh, years. Yeah. Actually, you know, we, we actually dated for four years before getting married. So we're together for 25 years. So and having to think, so thinking that I'll bring my experience, you know, because I was really experienced in this in, 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 in my marriage. So I thought, okay, let me bring the experience and try to impose it on this new marriage. Wrong. So I had to quickly on learn so that I can relearn, you know, to, to make sure that this lady who has never been married, who has been single for for all of her life, you know, set in her ways, you know, set in her ways, to a degree, <laughs> you know, um, and it, it, I, I have said to you, I mean, the first year or two was quite um, challenging for us, but we stayed, we prayed together, you know, we went to church together, we we. Uh, you know, we laughed together, we shouted together, and, so, and that was great. I cried, you didn't cry, ago. men don't cry. You know, <laughs> and you know, and sometimes, you know, because because of the relationship I had with the kids, you know, it was it was a bit strange for her because, because you know, and I said to her that, listen, you are my wife, which means in my eyes, you can do no wrong. Not that you don't do wrong things, but 
you know, I just don't, I would not say the wrong things that you do. And that's the same thing with the kids. But it, it took her time to get to get used to it. And we, uh, we've we been on this journey now for 12 years and it, it's just getting better. I mean, what I said to her is that, you know, you will be the envy of, you know, of other people. Because you see, the Bible says blessed. Somebody who is blessed is fortunate, happy, to and to be envied. So as we go in this journey, she will be, she's blessed, she's happy, and she will be envied. And she's, uh, and we are, we are, we are having a good time. And, and of course, my wife is somebody that, you know, I can give her, I can give her, you know, when she has 10 pounds, she will stretch it to make, I mean, that she will make that 10 pounds to be 100 pounds. Yeah. So I'd rather give her my 10 pounds because if that 10 pounds stays in my pocket, that's, that's the end of it, you know. <laughs> but if, um, so now, you know, to the glory of God, she and the children are the, the best of friends. I mean, my uh, grandchildren, daughter, when, when they come to the house, I mean, she doesn't even want to come to me. She goes straight to her. You know, because we, we've built this relationship, you know, God has helped us all along. Amen. Amen. Um, anything else you want to add? Yeah, nothing, <laughs> nothing. I am, I am truly blessed. I, I will not lie. Um, it, it has, it's been a journey. And um, one good thing is once you know that you know you are with the one, the challenges come, yes. They're not easy, yes. But because you know there's a peace somewhere down there, where you just know that, listen, no matter what, this thing cannot fall. And you know, there was a time when I went to him and I said, listen, if it's time to, are we ready to go our separate ways? Because you're not listening to me, da, 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 da. But of course, you know, we, we both know deep down that I ain't going nowhere and he ain't going nowhere either. You know, praise God. And there's just a peace. So it's very important that we know that we know we've met the right person, you know? you know that you know you've met the right person. I, I, I used to have conversations with him before he ever showed up. I, I would have conversations, you know, there was a particular one that I can never forget. I was having a conversation with the person I had never met. And I said to him, he was saying to me, oh, um, can I use your Oyster card and go into town with it? And you know, when we got married, like two, two years into it or something, he comes to me and says, oh, can I borrow your Oyster card? I said, even if I didn't know you were the man, today I know you are the guy because you're the guy I had that conversation with back then. You know, it's just a wonderful thing. And yes, the Bible says um, hope deferred makes the heart sick. But it is, the, the hope is never deferred forever. It's never deferred forever. Yes. God always shows up. If he doesn't have, have, if God has not arrived by 1159, you do know by 1201 that God has arrived. He's ne it may sound like it, he's never late. It is so true. God always keeps his promises. And that's all I think we have yep. done. Thank you very much. Thank for you for listening. Pastor David still needs to tell us about the village one. You missed that one, Pastor David. <laughs> what's, what's the village one again? The village, oh, the, when he arrived, when he okay, arrived. Well, I mean, it was actually it was was, because my, my, uh, my uncle died and we, we, I mean, I'm from a place called, you know, Delta State, which is, you know, in the so eastern, you know, Midwest. Mm. And she, she came from, you know, the West. So it's, yes, so it's, quite, it's, it's quite a, a journey. And I had to attend my uncle's funeral and then travel back to Lagos and from Lagos go to her Our that village. funeral, which was, which was miles away. And of course my brother drove and it was quite, and they said, you know, it's a very dangerous drive, you know, and I'm thinking it took us quite a while to find the place. We got there in the end and the night, so we stayed, you know, we spent a very lovely weekend with them. And then um, in the village, that's when I now went to, you know, I went to her room. Oh, by the way, we didn't do anything. We kissed, but we didn't. You know, not on that first not night. Not on the first night. I mean, you know, we kissed months and months later, mm -hmm. you know, so, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, we, we make, you know, nothing happened until, until after the, the wedding. We kissed between May and between May and October when we got married. So, um, so, uh, but in the village, there, there wasn't really that much that happened apart from when, when they, my, my, fr you know, her, her friend said that, okay, this guy is wearing a very good. And actually, when I had told her that, listen, you are going to be my wife, she said that I should go and pray about it. I said, there's no need to pray, you know. I am convinced that you are my wife. So, I've already prayed before. So, this time, this is manifestation. Amen. So we just moved on from there. Yep. And um, it has been a wonderful journey. And 
we 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 believe that God God who has started in work will will finish it. Amen. I mean, what 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 for us for me being a man, I you know don't forget yeah especially from where we come from you know the man wants to be the boss you know one man wants to boss everything, but we you know I I had to learn quickly that it, you know it just doesn't work like that so I and so I go to the kitchen if I find any dishes or pots or thing in the in the sink. I don't wait for her to clean it. I just go there, clean it up, and, that, and that's it. it. Doesn't take anything from me. So that's how we have lived, and that is why we, you know, and things have been, you know, we 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 we, we encourage ourselves and we help each other. And we, uh, one one good thing about having a, a, the partner that you know that you know is what Joshua and um, uh, sorry, um, Glenda. What's that? Sorry, Glenda. 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 Yeah, what they said earlier. You have to connect on the spiritual level. Yeah. Very important, you know. So we have conversations around the Bible. It's so exciting sometimes, you know. I'm like, then there are times when I'm like, woo, prophet, go for it, you know. It's it, it's 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 a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful thing, and I believe that for anyone believing and waiting and trusting God for this, you will have it. You will have it. You will have it. I mean, we, we read something on Wednesday, oh, know, which yeah. I find, Isaiah, very, you know, which I really find so profound, you know, about waiting. And waiting, like I said, you know, sometimes waiting is spelled, you know, T-R-U-S-T, -T, trust. Mm -hmm. And it says in some, in some 40, verse, verse 1. Some 40, from the TPT version. From the, the Passion. It says, I waited and waited waited some more patiently knowing god would come through for me then at last he bent down and listened to my cry i waited and waited and waited some more patiently knowing god would come through for me then at last he bent down and listened to my cry and that should be our testimony that god listens he does he does thank you very much Ah, uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. We do have some questions already waiting for you. Oh, though. really? Okay, Just okay. <laughs> yes. So be, but before we finish, I think this question came through. And Dupsi, are you ready with the question? This question came through from somebody who is a widower, who is on this platform at this point in time. Okay. And he's asking, how long do you think I need to wait for, sir, before I propose or start looking? <laughs> I, I, you know, now you've said wait. So wait, wait, and wait patiently. You know, just trust God. That's why I said waiting, wait actually is spelled T R U S T. Correct. You know, so those, those that trust in the Lord shall renew their strength. You know, you know in some places, say those that wait. Mm -hmm. But when you're waiting, you're actually trusting God that God will come through. You know, I, I didn't set out to, to get a wife, if you know what I mean, you know. Mm -hmm. But just, yeah. but once you trust God, God will show up. Wow. Um, God will show up, but that, that the most important thing is let God be God, and you know He will He will come through. Uh, uh, can Can I also add that um, I think also for a gentleman, um, it's very, for especially for the man, it's very important that you're not going into the relationship for the wrong reasons. E.g., I'm lonely. Yeah. E.g., I'm uh, you know my body. Yeah, I've got those issues, you know, yeah, yeah, you know, let's talk, mm -hmm. you know, because when, if that happens, things fade so quickly. But if you're in it for the right reasons, listen, I believe God. One of the things I said to him, I, he said to me, uh, well, I said to him, listen, I've been brokenhearted too many times. So I decided to give my heart to God to lock it up in a safe. And then Lord, when the right guy comes along and asks you for the key to that safe then you can give it to him so i told him i said look you have to go to god if god gives you the key to my heart then you can come back he said he already has it he's already gone to god you know so for a gentleman um it has to be the fact that you you feel a release you feel a release a peace in your heart that now is the time now is the time I, it's very hard to say six months or put it put a, an actual calendar frame on it i believe it's it's a bit hard and i'm this is me wearing my pastoral cap. Yeah, I mean, which is, you know, which is absolutely right because um, 
you, you, don't, you don't give yourself time. Mm. You just stay, mm. you know, mm. stay and let God be God. Mm. I think that's uh, probably and, grow. and just grow. Let, let, let God be your, you know, just grow in him. Mm. Yeah. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Josh, you wanted to say something? Because I think you're, did you do want to say something, Josh? Yeah, I, I don't know whether it will be helpful, but the situation is slightly different. But I, let me explain what I did. About two weeks before Glenda and I were due to marry, um, even though my ex-wife and I were divorced, I still felt this kind of, I still felt a connection that was bothering me. I felt like I wasn't completely free. Um, and I went to see a minister and he actually suggested something, which I did. Now, a lot of you won't know, but my heritage is actually Jewish. I didn't know I was Jewish. My mother was adopted. It's a long story, but we found out when I was in my late teens that I'm actually Jewish. And what I, what I did was I found a, um, a 10th century Jewish divorce certificate. And I actually wrote out the divorce between me and my ex-wife, even though legally we had been divorced. And then I burnt it. And I'm not trying to suggest anything occultic or anything like that. Not, nothing like that was on my, on my heart. But when I did that, I felt an incredible release. And, and while it would be wrong of me to tell you exactly what to do, um, I wanted you to know that that's what I did. Because however odd it sounds, it actually, it really made a difference. Excellent. Dupsy, do you have any questions that we need to share now? Because I see a couple coming on. Just be, we're going to have a session on blended families in, I think in August now on our, on our calendar, it's August. Um, what can you both, because most ladies, when they are over a certain age, we're expecting that they go into a blended family. And from a man and a woman's perspective, that means different things, you yeah. know? So do we, can you please have, just give us a few nuggets on that before we go into the question. Yes, blended families. Is that from? Uh, is that from us or from? Oh, you must yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, Sorry for me. You're you're on mute. That doesn't help. <laughs> I said, Josh, I know that I know that you guys you had children before you came into the marriage, and same with them, Pastor David. And you just tell us, and I know we're going to have a bigger thing in August, but just for a few more minutes before we leave tonight, talk to us about blended families. Well, how did you, how did you blend in to, to, how did your children accept what makes it better in a relationship? Just talk to us a bit for, for about two minutes before, before we go on. Um, okay, for me, um, our culture is, um, part of the Guyanese culture is every older person is auntie and uncle anyway. So for my children, even before they met um, Joshua, um, they already accepted him as uncle because he loved their mother and he's going to marry their mother. So he's their uncle, that's it. Um, on the other side of that, Joshua's children, they're English. So they were brought up here and mm -hmm. they don't uncle and auntie anyone yeah, unless a blood relative. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, Joshua has been trying a bit to kind of get them to call me auntie because he was trying to get everybody on the same level. Mm -hmm. um, but the children didn't really, that didn't sit really well with them. Mm -hmm. I personally didn't have a problem with him. I said to him, look, give them time. Whether they call me auntie or not, I'm still going to be here. I'm still your wife. I'm still going to love mm -hmm. you. It's not going to change anything. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, even to now, the kids, they call me Glenda because that's how the England, English children speak to me. Mm -hmm. My mm -hmm. children still see him as uncle. He might have some other experiences as well that you want to share. Yeah, I, I, I do want to say that um, it's difficult. Don't, don't be fooled. There are <laughs> very considerable challenges that go along with this um, and there were times which I didn't really tell Glenda about there were times when I went in my bedroom and cried and mm. thought I can't do this mm. um, but what I did learn is especially as a man trying to take on a stepfathering role mm -hmm. especially with three children from another culture and another father I had mm -hmm. to do an awful lot of apologizing 
when I overstepped the mark culturally mm -hmm. and personally, I didn't understand where they were coming from. Mm -hmm. um, one example was in a Guyanese culture, you don't look an older person in the eye. But in English culture, you don't look someone in the eye as rude. It's considered like bad character, mm. you know? So this is one of the things I had to learn and overcome. I'm not saying don't do it, but mm. I'm saying that it, it's, it's a lot better now. But for years, it was really, really, tough. really, really hard. Um, and you have to be prepared to stick with it, show mm. them that you love them. And that's what breaks through in the end. Mm. Mm. Pastor, Pastor B, you wanted to say something? Um, for, for me... Oh, oh, sorry. What did you... Was it yeah. me? Pastor B or Pastor David? Oh, okay. Um, I, I think I, I would um, concur seriously with... Um, uh, oh, my goodness. I'm so terrible. Joshua, Joshua. Joshua. Sorry. I'm so... Uh, uh, very, very true. Just like he did, I, there are many, many, many nights I would, you know go somewhere else and just cry because I didn't have kids. I still don't have any of my own. And um, when you're trying to deal with other, other somebody else's kids, you're, I could only do what I know to do, you know? And I, I, a lot of times I would take it all out on him. And don't forget these kids were teenagers. <laughs> Teenager, I heard a man say once, a father of teenagers said once, he said, it's easier to raise the dead than to raise teenagers. <laughs> yeah. And here I was, I wasn't even trying to raise anyone because they were fully cooked as far as I was concerned. But I was trying to get in, get involved. So you don't even know if you take this step, you are, you, you've offended them. If you take that step, you don't care. So where do you, you, you find the very... It's a very um, difficult Inland. terrain to, 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 to maneuver or whatever, because you don't know when you should get involved or when you should stay out of it. You don't know when you should speak and ask after. It's, a, it's, it's, it's tough, to be very honest with you. It's <laughs> tough to be uh, the, and you're, you're, you're uh, there many times, many, many times, and he knows this, because I say it to him a lot of times, one feels like an outsider. You feel like an outsider, even though here you are, you, you want everybody to be, uh, yeah, happy families and all that. But you still have that, mm, because they would rather talk to their dad. They would rather take their problems to their dad. They would rather, oh, um, even if they want something from me, they come through him. <laughs> you know, and I'm like, why do you have to come to me? Don't, don't come to me. Tell them to come to me so that even if there's anything, at least that shaves off all the, you know, tell, go to her, she's not gonna bite you, you know? And he didn't do a lot of that, sadly, because I, you know, I, I guess it was, it's, it's hard and I appreciate that. But it's, it's, it's a very, it's, you know, you're treading on eggshells all the time. And yet this is your home, this is your family. Um, but you find yourself, you know, oh, should I ask, should I, should I give, should I, should I, you know? And then where you think, okay, financially speaking, we're not here. And here are the kids wanting to go over and beyond what you have. It sounds like, oh, here's the wicked stepmother who won't let us, you know, have ice cream. Or I'm just using that as an example. Uh, okay, you, you buy four packs of uh, crunchy nut, four boxes of crunchy nut, and three of them are finished in two days. <laughs> Then the next time you buy four packs of crunchy nut, you hide three so that they take it one at a time. And then you are the one who hides, you know, the woman who's always hiding food from them, you know? So you, how do you do this? You know, you buy eggs, you have to hide, hide eggs because these are these big chunky guys who say they have to eat 12 eggs at, at one sitting. And you're thinking, no, you can't eat 12 eggs at one sitting except you give me money and I buy the 12 eggs, then you can eat it at your, but if I buy 12 eggs, please have three, three at a time or something. So all this gets, uh, the, you know, uh, well, who is she, who does she think she is? So you get all that and I wouldn't lie to you. It, 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 so, and so that it doesn't affect my health, there are times when I just decide, okay, you know what? What else can I say? Yeah. And then he smiles and it's like, oh, you know. <laughs> okay. 
I mean, that was quite, that's a long time ago. Yes. That's a long time ago, praise <laughs> so, God. They are now adults. We moved on from, from, we moved on from all they, that. They, they're all raising their own families now. Yes, so, and they're um, now eating 12 eggs a day. So they can eat 12 eggs a day. And we get to have them maybe <laughs> once, once, once a day. year. <laughs> yeah. Wow, wow, wow. That's really good. Are there any, Dupsi, are you ready with any more questions, please? And uh, did Jolomi, did you want to say something? I can't see you, sorry. I've had a question. Yes, we, we have questions. Um, for me, do you want me to read the questions or do you want We have else? about four minutes to go. Okay. And um, I just wanted to thank everybody first for coming on. And um, we will be here if we need, we're going to stay on from after half six. If there are more questions, we're going to be here to take it. I want to personally thank Joshua and Glenda and Pastor David and Pastor Bolanley for sharing your heart. Thank you know, you. I, 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 I want to thank you with all the, everybody on this platform right now. Thank you so much. Um, I think one of the things I want you to do is just type whatever nation you are, you are you're, you're logging in from. If you're logging in from America, tell us what state you're logging in from. Let's just know so that we know what God is doing. We are really grateful for everybody that has turned out today. Our next meeting yes. is in exactly, <laughs> there's, still, there's some funny comments coming in online. Oh, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for everybody. You know, so wherever you've logged in from, we just want to thank you. Thank you for logging in from Kent, from Chicago, from New York, from everywhere you are. We've seen Houston. Thank you, New York City. I see that. Lagos, Nigeria. I see that. Thank you. Thank you so much. God bless you. We're going to be here in exactly four weeks. Thank you. Thank you for dialing in from Lagos. In exactly four weeks, May the 20th, March the 20th, we're going to be here. I want you to specifically type, type thank you to, to Pastor David and Pastor Bolanley and, Past, um, and Joshua and Glenda. Thank them so much. We're going to, like I said, we're going to be here in the next then um, for about 10 more, 15 more minutes. If you have any questions, we're gonna be addressing your questions. All the ministers of single but not satisfied are on hand to handle your questions. And we want to thank you specifically. Please feel free to take a picture of the next event. Like I said, it's happening in exactly four Gosh. weeks. I'm going, to, I'm going to pray right now. And have you typed thank you to Pastor B, please? Can you say oh. thank you? <laughs> Pastor, thank you, Pastor David. Pastor David, I understand you never really, you're not into coming out, but thank you for coming today. God will honor you as you honor <laughs> um, Josh and Glenda, please thank you so, so much. I love you. I know you're going to come see me in this, my village, and happen then very, very soon. I appreciate you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank we're going you to pray now me. and we're just going to finish. Thank you, ma'am. I appreciate you so, so very Thanks much. God bless you. Thank you. Your program, please, if you have the details, just put it on the chat so we can, we can. Logan, I had fun last time. I've told so many people about that. That was really, really lovely. We're going to pray right now. I'm going to close, but just stay on if you have any more questions. Heavenly Father, we thank you for such an awesome time we've had today. Thank you for this live testimonies. Thank you for what we've gleaned from them. You're such an awesome and a good God. Mm. Thank you for that scripture that Pastor David read. Thank you because no person waiting is waiting in vain. You are a yes, good sir. God. And this year, 2021, you are accelerating stuff. You are doing a quick work. You yes. are cutting it short in righteousness. Thank you for the ability to see and to discern, just like both of them said, both couples, the ability to see and know what you plan so that we don't go after our own eyes. We don't, we don't, we don't judge by what we see or what we hear or what, or, or what we think it should be, but we'll be led and influenced by you. We love you, Lord. We appreciate you. Thank you because you will bring everybody back with a testimony in the mighty and awesome name of Jesus we have prayed. Amen. 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 And amen. Thank you so much. God bless you, and we'll see you on March the 20th. If you can't stay on, please do stay on. Get Grab a drink. We'll go through the questions, and we'll, 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 we'll try and co communicate the answers to you as much as we can. Thank you so much. God bless you. Amen. 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 Thank, you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for Thank having you. us. Thank, Thank you. you for having Thank us. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. You see, please fire on with the questions and people stay tuned. God bless you. Okay. So we're going to go with the first question. And um, it goes, 
I think the first one's already been answered. How long should I wait as a widower to be remarried? The next question is, how can, church, how can the church help people that are single um, that they want to marry? That means how can the church help singles to get married? So yes, go for it, go for it, yes. Um, I mean, like, like I said earlier, and if, if I'm on the wrong page, then please just ignore me, but I believe it has to be made acceptable from the pulpit for uh, men and women to spend time together in a godly way. I, the, the reason I know this is, is because the church I, I came from, they, they taught us essentially how to date yeah. in a godly way, taking the, the romance out of it to start with and making it about spending time with your brothers and sisters. And I, I, I'm really of the strong opinion that if that's not part of your church culture, then go and talk to your pastor or pastor's wife and say, you know, can we have more teaching about this? I mean, the other things are, are fairly obvious, you know, singles events, single mingles. Um, I would also say, and I know my wife gave this idea, uh, do, do a cooking. Yeah. Honestly, I, I, I tell you the truth, a brother will eat something from that table. <laughs> it's true. It, it's true. And he'll go, which sister cooked this? And, and yes, your love story might, might start over, over some curry or roti or, or, or jello rice, you know, that, anyway, that's, that's what we want to say. Yeah, um, I can add to that as well. I would say um, as singles get together, have little house fellowships. I mean, at the moment you probably can't, but soon we'll be able to do it. Have a few house fellowship, invite a few people over. And if there's someone like a brother or a sister in the congregation that you're interested in, invite them along with the crowd, get to know each other on a social basis in a safe space. You don't have to prepare everything. Everybody can bring a bottle, Everybody can bring a dish or you just, you know, major down on just one dish and everybody bring a drink and everybody, you know, people come along, you do it maybe six people at a time, but be more, you know, open yourself to fellowship because if you want to meet people, you got to show yourself friendly if you want friends, isn't it? Yes. So you show yourself friendly, you will get friends. And that brother who might not never see you in the congregation, he might never been able to come close to you before suddenly is in your space. You know, you can get to know each other a bit better. That's great. Thank you. Um, anyone wants to add to that? Okay. Let me just say one thing, though. Um, I, I think the church plays a big part in, in, in encouraging um, the, the, the singles uh, within within their church. So uh, if we have any pastors out there, please um, provide the platform for them. Uh, speak about it from the pulpit. Let them be aware. Let the singles be aware that they that they are recognized, that that they are loved, and that they are, that you are doing something for them. So, I think from the pulpit is important as well that the message is clear, that the singles are loved, appreciated, and that you are praying for them, and that that they are an important part of the ministry. That's and if I can also just add a line to that. The, un the unfortunate thing is most of the teachings from the pulpit regarding it have been single and still, uh, or sorry, being older and still single, or being a widow or widow as, and therefore looking for a partner or being divorced and wanting to remarry. Most of the messages that the churches are preaching is they are contrary to the idea of getting married or remarried. And I think it's wrong uh, because on one hand, we the church is preaching, do not be unequally yoked, uh, wait for your husband and wait for your wife and all of that. But at the same time, we are also preaching, if you've been divorced, you can't remarry. If you're a widow, widow then the chances of you remarrying is uh, it's very slim. But most of that are rooted in religion and tradition. Uh, you need to go back to God by yourself. I, I know this may not be theologically correct, but my 
personal conviction is the only thing that will stop you from going to heaven is if you denounce Jesus Christ. Not if you remarry after you've been divorced. Not if you remarry because you are a widow or widower. And so sometimes we need to get past the religion and the traditional blockage that are really man-made to really see and seek what God has for you. We've heard tonight from these two wonderful couples. We have amongst ourselves people who are once married and now they are remarried and they are living a good, God-driven, God-centered life. And so I think the church needs to find a way to change that message. And within ourselves, we need to get rid of tradition and religion and really go to God and get out the answers that we need. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm gonna to go to the next question. So can I just say something on that last one? Go ahead. Um, I think a lot of people feel that they have to meet their spouses in church. And I think, I'm, I don't know, I don't even know if I missed any, some of what was being said, you know, but I don't think there's anybody that actually stands on the, to minister the single but not satisfied that met their husband or wife in church. God is bigger than your church. I didn't meet my husband in my church. Neither did you, Dupsy. You know, not so, even so, so, <laughs> not even in your country. <laughs> you know, and same with Joshua and Glenda, actually, not even in their country. So, so just, 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 just let God be God. You know what I mean? Most people didn't. Just nobody here talking on out of these five people on here met their spouses in church. God is bigger than your church. That's all I wanted to say. Dupsy, please. Thank you. So there's a um, there's a question, and we may have answered that. That um, please share encouragement. To those who are waiting. Any nuggets of encouragement you can share with those who are waiting? Depends on what exactly, I mean, what encouragement. And I, I would encourage you to wait on God, delight yourself in God. Um, as I said before, make yourself more friendly, wear a smile, um, be happy to serve, you know, um, be willing to attend events when events like these are planned be willing to attend, um, go, go above and beyond, you know, some people sow into other people's lives, sow into a couple, look at a couple in your congregation that you really admire and sow into their life, support, help them in whatever way you can. And I don't mean just financially, but if they've got children, step up to support them with their children, help them out a bit, sow into people's lives, you know, it, this all brings fruit eventually. Can, can I add to that, that um, the, the things Glenda says, uh, I believe they all round out your character. And, and certainly a woman of God who serves actively is attractive to a man of God. Let's, let's not, again, let's just be clear on this, um, that a, a, a woman serving is beautiful and attractive in her own right. But I do believe that we do need, or we're well, not us, but <laughs> um, you need to put yourself out there in the, in terms of, you know, meeting other Christians, attending other churches. There was always the accusation back in the day of being a church hopper and not being serious and bloom where you're planted, which that last part certainly has some truth to it. But Christianity is too fractured. Your husband absolutely can, or wife, can be somewhere else yeah. and if you pursue fellowship with a pure heart show yourself friendly serve you, you don't know who's going to notice you yeah. you know i walked into her church yeah. she we weren't from the same we congregation from the same we were from totally i came from another country to begin with as a christian broken from another country to this country for god to send him to me and i had to go to a different congregation yeah. as well where he walked in and it wasn't even his congregation. I, I would say, you know? finally, do, do know what you believe, because I, I shared earlier that, you know, we share the same sort of salvation theology, if you like. Mm -hmm. But there are certain things we definitely don't agree on. But that's OK, because they're not, they're not salvation, they're not issues, salvation yeah. issues. And that gives you a foundation to work with. However, if you believe something completely opposite to the other person, yeah. You're going to have to either work that through or it might not work. Anyway, thank you. Okay. I think the only thing I'll add to encourage um, singles at this time, especially at this time where it's very difficult to date, 
There's lockdown everywhere. Just understand that you're not the only one going through this. So it's not just you. God is very much aware that um, we are on lockdown, but he's the God of, 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 of miracles. He can make things happen. He is not restricted by lockdown. So be expectant at every time that God can make things happen for you. That's my encouragement. So I say something? Yes, please. Sorry. Uh, while waiting doesn't mean you'll be idle. Waiting doesn't mean you'll be passive. You can be waiting. In fact, you should be active while waiting. Mm -hmm. And part of the practical ways to do that is to widen your circle of contact and friends. Uh, if you hang out with the same set of people you've been with for the last 18 years <laughs> and you haven't found anybody in their midst, then maybe you're digging in a dry well. Mm -hmm. So you might need to widen your circle of contacts and influence. Mm -hmm. Don't just hang out with singles. Mm -hmm. Sometimes your your the person that you're gonna get married to could be friend to a couple that are already married. Have couples who have married couples as your friends, because most of the time they have friends who are either divorced or widowed or uh, a nephew somewhere or a niece somewhere. And unless you open yourself up to that circle unless you, you are within the catchment, quote and unquote catchment area of such circle, you won't, you won't, you won't see the, the opportunity. Also, I know we've given a wrong perception and a wrong meaning to online dating. It, it's not all doom and gloom. You just have to do your due diligence. You just have to make sure you are fishing within the Christian online dating. And even while you're there, make sure you, you have good security around yourself and now around what you're looking for, what you settle for, what you accept and all of that. As you do that, God is not limited, like Fumi said, to the four walls of your church. And he knows what you want and he will give it to you. Amen. Thank and you. also, if you are somebody who looks at statistics or the X number of men or X number of women in the, in the world, the Lord doesn't look at that. Have a positive attitude and believe that even if those statistics do exist, it has no impact, no influence upon you. You will get what you want. So don't, let, don't be bogged down by um, things that are being said on social media that uh, is out there to discourage people or statements such as not everyone needs to get married. Don't be bogged down by that. If it's your desire to get married, you seek the Lord and you will get married. Okay. Actually, I think you may have answered the next question. I'm not sure if this person is still online, but the question was, what do you, what, what do, you do if you think you do not want to get married ever? Is that wrong? Again, that comes from um, listening to people who um, would um, peddle these kind of uh, uh, statements, sometimes just to justify um, the way they see, it, uh, see the world, but it doesn't apply to everyone. And it definitely doesn't apply to you if you want to get married. Because someone says it doesn't mean, doesn't mean you have to repeat it. Because it comes out from social media doesn't mean it's true. The Bible is the one that's true. God is a, is a source of all truth. So if the Lord says it's not good for a man to be alone, that's the truth. You hold on to that and you go about your business with God in control. And, and also, uh, sorry, Rob, also with that, I think, uh, I know it's a, it's, a, it's a question on the forum, but the, for, for a question like that, that's, uh, I believe there's a deeper root. It could be because of prior disappointments or experience or whatever it is. As we go through life, sometimes we make what I call silent vows. And those silent vows, they, they become bonded. They become a hold back. They become like a, a, almost putting yourself in prison. Maybe you've been disappointed in a very bad way 
And within yourself, you say things like, I will never allow this to happen to me again. There's a place for you to make that decision to safeguard yourself. But when that, safe, that security becomes a prison that you lock yourself into, sometimes it ends up being what we've just been, the question saying, I, I will never get married. I don't want to ever be married. So maybe there's a reason behind why you come to that conclusion. And maybe um, you just need to that was to actually my That was my question. And I, I newly found at that conclusion because for the past five years, I was taking care of my dad. He had a terminal illness. And then with this whole COVID thing, it got worse and you know some situations happen anyway he passed away and I used to want to get married until after I took care of him for so long and then I started getting very fearful that like what if I get married and then my spouse gets sick if anybody's ever taking care of someone that's ill it's a big responsibility so I feel I kind of lost myself like the past five years and then this past year with the shutdown you know, I gained weight. I guess I was stressed out. My hair fell out. Everything sagging. Like I literally, to me, don't even look like the same person that I was before going into the shutdown. And it's actually a young man at my job that's very attracted to me. He's been attracted to me for two years. And I didn't give him any time of day because I was too busy with my dad. But now I have that time free, but I feel like I'm so traumatized and I was very close to my dad which is why I sacrificed everything to take care of him and now I'm afraid that whole death what do they say to death do you part like I don't really want to have to care for anybody ever you know to that degree it was so hard and traumatic for me even that my dad just passed away a few weeks ago sorry to hear um, that condolences uh, our condolences and our, our prayers are with you. And I completely, uh, totally understand what, you, what you're talking about, especially having to care for somebody that you deeply love, like, your, like you said, with your dad and all of that. But the question I want to, the, the, the way I want you to see it is, you've given your life, like you said, the past five years of your life, looking after your dad. I think one of the ways you can honor him is to start living your own life. And part of that is you finding that peace, that joy, that what makes you, you. And part of that is having somebody you share life with. Secondly, not everybody will end up needing this type of care that you're talking about. And you've got to approach it from the, the, from the viewpoint of not, not from a fearful point of view, because you are afraid that if I go into a relationship and this person needs my attention like my dad needed, I don't think I have anything left to give, which is a legitimate fear. But the question is, what if the person never needs any care? You can't live. You can't live the rest of your life being held back by that fear. I would say, let spread your wings, fly, enjoy your life. Your father, your dad will want that for you more than anything. And one of the ways you can honor him is to be happy. And that partly could be you getting married and having fun even at it. Thank you for sharing this with us. Our thoughts and our prayers are with you and your family. Thank you. Okay, can I just add to that as well? Um, I think you've put your, you've touched your, you've touched it, you've touched your finger on it, Pastor Disu. Um, I just want to encourage you, my sister, for 2 Timothy 1, 7 said, God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of power, of love and a sound mind. And so I just stand in agreement with you today that healing would heal you from all those hurts and you know the pain of seeing your dad passed away and 
The years you have given to your father, God can give it back to you. Amen. He can give it back to you in good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. So start believing for yourself again, okay? Start believing God can do this for you. But that scripture, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, read that and encourage your spirit in that. And start believing again. And reach out to that brother again. Good. Can I just add to that very briefly? Yes. Luke go ahead. Was your, okay. And something I didn't share, but my, my childhood was very traumatic. I was abused in, in a number of ways. And over the years, I, I worked through it. And certainly meditating on the scriptures helped me change my identity and self-concept, which is essential. But also there's, there's increasingly good resources available to the general public on understanding trauma. Um, what I might do, if I can dig out some of the titles that I've read in the last few years, I'll, I'll send them to the organizers. Um, you don't have to. It's, it's, it's not that the Lord can't heal you. I'm not saying that at all. But the Lord didn't ask Luke to stop being a doctor. Uh. So it may well be that the, the pain and difficulty of, that you've gone through is something that might benefit from, from uh, some professional help as well. Uh, certainly for me, I, I've been able to process some pretty traumatic stuff and move forward. So um, if that helps, I can do some books. Thank you very much, um, uh, Joshua. And please, um, I hope you will reach out to us. The email address for me is um, sbnsuk at outlook.com. Please reach out to us and we'll try and pass the names of the books to you. Thank you for being here and God bless you. So I'm gonna to go to the next question. I think we have about two, two, two more questions. What's your take on marrying someone who is divorced or his wife is still alive? I think this probably was a question for Pastor David, but um, can any of the speakers help us? So I think what we had heard Dr. from Pastor David. <laughs> <laughs> I let Dr. Burrow take that. Okay. Can you just read the question again, please? So again, the question is, what is your take on marrying someone who is divorced but his wife is still alive? So basically, you're not getting married to a widow. You're getting married to someone whose spouse is still alive. I kind of get the sense that there's a lot more behind that question. Um, because standing by itself, it's... It, 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 um, the assumption most times is that uh, if you're marrying a divorced person, that the, the, the husband or the wife is is alive. It's not you know usual for the person not, not to be around. But I would say that in, in, in all cases, uh, of course, there's now a, a third party, so to speak, in the relationship, especially if there are kids involved. And you have to learn to find a way to walk through it. Every situation is different. There's not. There's no two situations that are, that are exactly the same. And in, in your unique situation, uh, there has to be wisdom on how to handle it. Because uh, yes, the, the, the husband or the wife might be, 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 be uh, still be alive, but what led to the divorce uh, obviously is is varied. There's so many different scenarios that one could go through. It uh, I means limitless. So for each unique situation, there has to be a unique answer. There's no one fit all uh, for this particular, this particular question. But you can always seek counsel, seek God, and, and not be led by, by anger or, or by, 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 by negative emotions that would ruin things. Because in some cases, children might be involved, and that also needs to be um, taken into consideration. I don't know if that answers the question, but if it, if it can be something more specific, I could narrow it down a little bit more. Okay. I think it may also um, be, may have been answered when we talked about blended families, because um, typically that might be the major issue in, in a relationship where one of the spouse 
is divorced. So I hope that um, that may have answered the questions as well. Thank you, Jolene. And the last question we have here is, what is your opinion on a single on single women, never married, over forty, trying to have a baby using medical signs, like I U I or I V F, while they wait on God on God's will for their husband? So, can a single woman, Christian single woman, go ahead to have a baby with scientific medical signs while still waiting for her husband. I can start with this one because I have a very good friend back in Canada who um, she was single before I left and she's still single right now, but um, she has since gone ahead and um, went through the um, IVF and she has a little boy. And uh, my take on this is it's a very personal yeah. um, decision that you have, you, you make, you know, um, there is no right or wrong. I think the most important thing is your convictions before the Lord. And if you feel strongly and you pray about it, I think the Lord would direct you. Um, you may get some oppositions because um, there, there could be hurdles in the way in terms of um, your availability once you have this child. Because now you have a newborn, you have to go through the pregnancy. You know, um, it may be difficult for a single man or a divorced man to approach a pregnant woman because they won't understand. So these are some of the things that you may want to um, have a good handle on how you address those kind of questions during the journey. However, like I said, I do have a friend who has gone through that in Toronto and she's doing great. She's still believing God for her, for her husband and her son is just delightful. So it's a personal question. Does anyone want to add to that? Just like you no. said, there is no clear cut. There's nothing in the word that says do or don't about those kind of things. It's just your personal conviction. You know, what do you, what's your personal conviction? I have, we have a meeting on this platform next week at one o'clock. If anybody wants to join, if you have any answers about reproductive medicine, it's next week on this same platform, same numbers, and it's at one o'clock. So if you want to, if you feel you need questions or you need to have, you, you want your questions answered, please feel free to join us at one o'clock on this same number, same platform next week, next weekend, next Saturday. So I think it's Naomi your... wants to say something. Naomi, you go ahead. You have your hand raised. Oh, sorry. Good afternoon. Good evening. It was just about what they said about, what the lady said about um, being um, single and wanting to have a kid on your own um all i would all, all i wanted to contribute was to say that sometimes being single you know and people equating your value as a woman to you know you being married or having children sometimes you feel pressured into having kids whatever way you do but um i would just say that sometimes you need to look beyond the pregnancy and having the child and the effect it will have on the child, which there may be none, there may be some, but it's thinking beyond where you are now and the instant gratification of having the child and thinking about what that child's life will look like five years time, 10 years time, um, always thinking about a sperm donor, maybe even happy without even having a father in the picture. But that was what I wanted to say. Thank you. And that's quite spot on. Having a child, and I have a young son, <laughs> and that's one of the reasons I kept going off camera to go and check. You know, it's it's a, it's it can <laughs> it can be it's demanding. He's having a very, a child. very gentle boy. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yourself. I mean, I have a, I'm, I'm a very good man, and between both of us, some of you, one of my close friends around here. When, when that, and, and, and you call and you see here, both my husband and I running around, rushing around, where is he, what is he doing? How much more by yourself <laughs> with no help, especially if you live, live abroad, <laughs> it's going to be, the dating game will fly out of the window. Trust me, you'll be so engrossed with the boy. So if you want to adopt, there's nothing wrong. If you want to, there's really no clear cut scriptures that says do or don't about this. So we can't, we can't, we can't, we can't, it's up to you. Let every man be fully convinced in his own mind. 
Thank you. And thank you so much, Naomi, for adding that, because that is really critical. You know, there are things down the road that you do have to consider, you know, not just for the gratification of the child, but also, you know, down the road, um, you know, your prayer point obviously has to increase because when you do meet the man, you're praying that you will meet a man who will be happy to adopt your son and all those kind of things that will come with it. It's not impossible with God, all things are possible, but you do have to consider everything. The Bible says, if you want to build a house, you do have to consider it before you start. So make sure you hear from God clearly, clearly before you take that kind of, because it's a huge decision to bring a child into this world. You know, so make sure you hear from God clearly and accurately before you make that step. Dupsi, I think there was one last question. There are 61 people still standing. Wow. Thank you for being here. <laughs> I'm just going to go. Uh, there, there is um, one question that was sent to me privately. Um, what encouragement can you give for someone who has been taken advantage of emotionally by the pastor of the church? And then she moved away to another congregation and opened up and opened up to a new pastor, but the previous pastor keep, still keeps his deeds a secret and you are wounded. Wow. Wow. Sorry, can you repeat that again? What encouragement can you give for someone who has been taken advantage of emotionally by the pastor? You move away to another congregation and open up to your new pastor, but the previous pastor still keeps his deeds a secret and you're wounded. Um, can I, can I, while I'm just thinking, um, I have had or where I came from, there are a few pastors who actually, I mean, I don't know in the sense of what um, the individual is saying, but based on my experience where I come from, I have seen at, at least two men of God, more, but at least two men of God come crumbling down really, really deeply and in indulging in some of these things um, with members, um, vulnerable members, women members in the congregation. So I'm aware that these things do happen. And I don't know if this is what has happened to this lady, um, but it hurts really deeply because they are supposed to represent God to you. Um, but for some reason or the other, they had something cross, their, 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 their representation cross. Um, and it had affected the church really deeply um, to the sense where the pastor had, had to have been removed. One of the pastor had to have been removed. However, the other pastor, he, the people give him grace and they are still working with him. At the end of the day, we still have to give them grace, but we still need to use wisdom. Um, I feel for you, my sister. I really feel for you because I know what it can be like based on what I've noticed and seen. However, God is a healing God. He is so healing and he can heal you where it hurts. And you know, the word of God said, touch not the Lord's anointed, nor do his prophets no harm. But it also says that he avenges us and vengeance is not ours. It belongs to God. Whatever in the darkness will come to light, this is what I know for sure will happen. So if he's hiding behind his sin, be sure that will come to light at some point. Um, you do need to move on. You would need to release him. It's going to be difficult. You would need to forgive him. But God is able to heal you and he is able to heal him from whatever heart condition he has. We're all human and human to, to air is human. Okay, so I'm asking you by God's grace to release him. You don't have to prove any point to anyone who is not obviously taking on what you're saying, but go to your father because he is his father and he is your father and he loves us all. And in his own time, he will deal with that matter. 
Amen. Thank you so much. Anything the men want to add? Yes. Um, I, I, I do want to say a couple of things. And I apologize up front if I'm completely wrong about this. Um, but I do feel I have to say um, something, um, uh, especially for, for the women. I think it's, it's dangerous and it's... Mm -hmm. It's a bit difficult when, uh, as women, we seem to feel the need to speak um, directly to our pastors to have some kind of personal one-on-one -on -one relationship with the pastor. We go, we go to church because we are seeking and and uh, we seek we the pastors are supposed to lead us that way on how we can come out of how we personally communicate one-on-one. -on -one guide us through the scriptures and they share insights with us. And then when we go home, we now have the, 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 the scriptures, the ammunition to go to the Lord, to seek the Lord for ourselves. So we don't have to go to God through a pastor. And, and unfortunately, if, if we now feel that we have to go always be in personal contact with a man of God before we can hear from the Lord, it leads to very unfortunate things. I'm making no excuses from the pastors absolutely wrong, completely out of order. But what can we do men or as women to ensure that we don't ensnare ourselves in situations like this? I think that we, would, we should learn and understand that when we go to church, we are seeking God first, not man. We're not going through man to get to, to God. We are, we are going, it's a one-on-one -on -one relationship. So whatever the pastor is doing, whatever miracles or prophecies that he is uh, able to do, we can do the same, and every one of us, depending on the relationship that we have directly with God. So I, I really feel for you, my sister, for, for what you've been through. I definitely don't want it to happen to you again. Maybe that's just a couple of things that you can learn from the experience. And like my sister has just said, um, release him. Vengeance belongs to the Lord, and he will definitely avenge on your behalf. God bless you. Thank you. And the last um, question, go ahead. Oh, sorry, go ahead, please. I, I just, I just wanted to say, um, sister, while while no one person took advantage of me, I believe. I think we may have lost him. Sorry, we lost you a little bit. Uh, he's he's frozen. Okay, maybe we'll come back to Joshua. Um, okay, I think they're frozen. Okay, the last question on this issue is, um, I'm sorry, on, on, on the list is, can you date someone younger than you? And I believe it's probably a lady asking, can she date someone younger than her? Yes. Okay. That's the answer, just yes. Yes. And the <laughs> at the end of the day age is a number that's right and when the bible talks about who to be connected with they say thou shalt not be joined to somebody who is younger than you the main criteria is is a person a believer if they have christ in their life and they are not a child make sure it's an adult in this case if you are happy and he or she is happy, at the end of the day, it, 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 it's like, should I marry somebody who is dark skin or light skin? It's neither here nor there. It's not the age you're marrying, it's the person. Yes. So yeah, go ahead, have fun at it too. Yes, it's good. So I'm gonna hand it back to Fumi. So that's it for now. And um, thank you for the 49 still standing. Um, do see if you just put the next month's event on. Thank you so much. We'll play some music and then we'll see you in the next four weeks to be precise. The 20th of March is gonna be awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you, men and women of God for standing. God bless you everybody. And we'll see you next in four weeks, March the 20th. Bye. Thank you guys. God bless. Thank you. Thank you.
God bless you. We finish the hundredfold in Jesus' Amen. name. Amen. Thank you so much. God bless you. Thank you for your Thank time. you very much. Uh, Thank you for a lovely session. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Just want to say thank you. Thank you very much. And that I look forward to this. I'm looking forward to graduating. But I, <laughs> I really look forward to it. You thank you so much. Thank you. Your